Welcome to a beautiful night from Fenway Park as this homestand continues for the Red Sox. It's game one of a three-game series between the Chicago White Sox and the Boston Red Sox. Hi again, everybody. I'm Don Orsillo, and welcome to Red Sox Baseball. Well, the Red Sox took two out of three from the Baltimore Orioles, and tonight they welcome the White Sox. It's been a weird year for the White Sox and disappointing so far. They're 20 games under 500 and currently in last place in the American League Central. However, they've been playing better baseball. In fact, the White Sox are Major League Best 10-2 and two since August 16th and have won six straight road games over that time. As a team, they're batting at 280, averaging five runs per game and have 10-plus hits in seven of the 12 games. Obviously, Ciel Garcia and Diane Viciedo have led the way with a combined nine extra base hits and 18 RBIs. Tonight, we welcome John Risch into the broadcast booth with us. And last night, John, a terrific night for Shane Victorino and what's turned out to be a terrific season. He's been playing great. He's got power. He's got defense. This month of August in particular, he's been fantastic. Four home runs in his last four games. They got him for his glove, and he's been like a center fielder in right field, which is part of the reason he's been so valuable. Hey, some people raising their eyebrows when this contract was signed, but boy, has he been worth every penny this year. Power like you wouldn't believe or certainly wouldn't expect. Eight home runs since the All-Star break. That leads the team. He's really been an offensive force, and he's been a stabilizing factor in this lineup. Shane Victorino back in the lineup tonight for the Red Sox, and so is Will Middlebrooks, who has performed very well since returning from the Pawtucket Red Sox. We'll find out why when we return. Hall of Famer Peter Gammons will be alongside right after this. between the White Sox and the Red Sox. Welcome back inside the broadcast with everybody. I'm Don Orsillo, now joined by Hall of Famer Peter Gammons. And Peter, Will Middlebrook's back in the lineup tonight for the Red Sox, and he has been excellent since returning from the Paw Sox. Well, I give him a lot of credit. He figured it out himself. What he did was he changed his approach. He, he used to have the pretty high leg kick. He flattened it out so he's much flatter. He sees the ball much later. He's able to stay back and drive the ball all over the field. We've seen he's had a lot of balls to right field, which he never did. He used to fly open and go for his pull power. And the other thing, too, is he told me, you know, it's taken a lot of pressure off his back. He's not j jarring down into the ground. It's been really good. And you look at what he's done, hitting 342 since he's been back with an OPS over 900. Uh, Stephen Drew's OPS is over 900 the last 30 games. Uh, Jared Saltalamaki is hitting over 300 the last 25 games. All of a sudden, the bottom of that order 
has become a vital part of this offense. Well, he hopes to keep it going tonight. And back on the mound tonight for the Red Sox is Ryan Dempster. The first time we've seen Dempster since August the 18th. Ryan comes in at 6-9 and nine with a 4.77 earned run average. We're back with the first pitch for Fenway right after this. Kia of New England, the all-new 2014 GMC Sierra, McDonald's of Boston, Toyota's official website for deals by at Toyota.com, Dunkin' Donuts, Verizon Fios, and by Southwest Airlines. Well, we welcome you to a beautiful night here from Fenway Park and remind you these aerial views are brought to you by Hood, the official dairy of the Boston Red Sox. Follow the Hood Blimp on Facebook and Twitter at Hood Blimp. It is a nice night here tonight. Blue skies at Fenway. Lights are on. And before we get it started, let's send it down to Jenny Dell. Well, Don, you were talking about the success of Shane Victorino to start off the show here. And normally a switch hitter, he's been hitting from the right side of the plate against righties due to a little left hamstring strain. And he's had so much success against it, 306 batting in those situations. It's been a nightmare for opposing pitchers and opposing managers as we hear our Geico quote of the day from Orioles manager Buck Showalter. He said, I don't think anyone can get him out right now. I hope he starts hitting left-handed again. Don, at 32 years old, Shane Victorino is hitting right-handed against righties for the first time since he was 19 years old. It is amazing, and he has been incredible so far this season and has really picked it up offensively lately, been terrific defensively as well. And the Red Sox will be looking to lean on him once again tonight as they have this three-game series get underway tonight. And uh, John Risch, who's joining us in the booth tonight, as well as Hall of Famer Peter Gammons, who will be along with us for the first three innings. And, uh, Peter, I will start with you. The Shane Victorino situation, I think a lot of people made some noise about the fact that he was going to get uh, $39 million to be a member of the Red Sox. And that seemed like a large sum for a guy who, uh, you know, finished his Phillies career not the best way, ended up with the Dodgers briefly and now here in Boston. But, boy, he's proving to be very, very good. Well, <clears throat> you compare his his on base, his OPS, um, every offensive statistic and runs saved 
uh, number one of any outfielder in the major leagues and Josh Hamilton being minus six. The comparison of Victorino and Josh Hamilton is almost laughable at this point. And one of the things it's really hard to see unless you're at the ballpark, but players talk it all, all the time, how he moves on every pitch. And that's mm -hmm. part of his defensive genius is he every count, every pitch, he, he, he moves around to right field. And it reminds me a lot of Dwight Evans. He used to do the same thing. And John, tonight we see Ryan Dempster on the hill tonight, and it's been a long time for Ryan Dempster, maybe a little rusty heading into this outing. You wonder all the time when you see a guy come off such a huge layoff. You get the five-game suspension after hitting A-Rod, and, and I thought that that might have been a little bit light. I wouldn't have been surprised if it was six or seven, but here he is, and now you're thinking, okay, as you line things up in September, and you're starting to look at the stretch, and you're starting to think about postseason, you'd like to see Ryan Dempster start to look a little bit more like the Ryan Dempster we saw in the early part of the season. We will find out tonight as the Red Sox have taken the field. Check out the Chicago White Sox starting nine. It's been a while since we've seen the White Sox. Alejandro Diaz is in center field. Gordon Beckham at second base. Alexei Ramirez at shortstop bats third with Adam Dunn, the power hitting DH. Paul Canerco at first base. Abasiel Garcia came over from the Tigers in right field. Jeff Kepinger is at third base with Diane Viciato in left field, and Josh Fegley does the catching. He bats ninth. Let's take a look at the season numbers for Ryan Dempster. Dempster makes his 26th start of the year. He has not won since July and comes in at 6 and 9 with a 4.77 earned run average, 132 Ks, the 64 walks, and opponents hitting at 262 against Dempster. The Red Sox defensively third to first in the infield. It's brought to you by Southwest Airlines. Will Middlebrooks at third base with Stephen Drew at short. Dustin Pedroia at second base. Mike Napoli at first. Left to right across the outfield. Johnny Gomes in left. Jacoby Ellsbury in center. Shane Victorino in right with Jared Saltalamaki doing the catching for Dempster. Red Sox ninth in fielding percentage in the American League. Umpiring crew tonight, Dana DeMuth has the play calling the balls and strikes with Paul Nauer at first base. Angel Hernandez, the umpire at second, and Doug Eddings is the umpire at third. Tonight's game is available in Spanish by pushing the SAP button on your television remote. Enjoy the game. Well, again, blue skies above Fenway Park and 79 degrees to get us started tonight. Breeze in from right at 11 miles per hour, and the forecast partly cloudy for the remainder of the evening. As the Red Sox welcome the White Sox, who are 20 games under 500. They are 56 and 76 coming in. They are 21 games back of the Tigers. Robin Ventura is having kind of a disappointing season with the White Sox this season. They certainly expected more in his second year at the helm. As Ryan Dempster is ready, and the first pitch of the ball game is in there for strike one. Peter, you take a look at the Red Sox schedule and. While the White Sox are playing very well, winners of uh, 10 of their last 12, this is the team that is probably not as good as the rest of the schedule the Red Sox will face in the coming weeks. Well, except that there are some people on this team they really don't know. They don't know that, that two Garcia is very well. You never know. I mean, this is something I talked to Buck Showalter about for a long time yesterday about how hard it is sometimes playing teams you don't know as and it gets into September and then they come in with like nine left-handed relievers and that kind of thing. The strength of schedule sometimes can be really overrated down the stretch. And the Red Sox coming up on a stretch that first has them play the White Sox here at home and the Tigers come in before the end of this homestand. And then the Red Sox have to go to New York and Tampa Bay. This will bounce in and even the count of two and two. There is the schedule upcoming for the Red Sox and of course after the New York and Tampa Bay stand, the Yankees will be waiting for the Red Sox when they return home. Right now the Yankees are five games back in the wild card chase. The Rays and the A's the top two teams in that category. Now for Ryan Dempster it's been a long time after that outing against a rod and the New York Yankees of course and the suspension. And now pitching at home once again. This one fouled back. It almost seemed like it kind of rejuvenated the Yankees at the time. It did. I mean, I think it, it, it took a little bit of a focus and made A Rod something of a sympathetic character. And it sort of took, oh, okay, this is why he's here. He's going to play. This is going to be it. We've had no protection out of third base all year. And I think it's, I think though, 
getting a little time off probably helped Dumpster. I think he probably needed a breath. And it's, it's no, I'm, I think most teams now had pitchers miss a star. They just, by only getting a five game suspension, like John said, well, that's like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> one trip through. <laughs> yeah. uh, one day, really. That's what it worked out to be. The leadoff walk here allowed to Alondra Diazza, who's down to first base, and it brings up Gordon Beckham. It's a 290 with four homers and 21 runs batted in. Well, the Red Sox starting pitching has been very good, especially when you take into account, John, that they've not had Clay Buckholz in a long time. And Clay actually is pitching tonight. I'm anxious to hear how he does in his rehab start for Pawtucket. But you're right. The starting rotation for the Red Sox have been fantastic. The White Sox have had very good starting pitching as well. And the Tigers, who we're going to see on Monday. 1-0 pitch foul back. And it's a ball and a strike now to Beckham. Problem for the White Sox has been trying to figure out how to score runs. Their offense is near the bottom of the American League. And you think of them as a team who hits home runs. They have for many years, and they did last year, but this year they're also struggling in the power department. And unfortunately, the Red Sox do not need to deal with Chris Sale in this series. We'll see John Danks and Andre Rienzo in this series. Runner takes off, throw is going to sail into center field. And remaining at second base is Diazza. And Salta Lamacchia off the mark with that throw. He's going to have a hard time getting him anyway. Yeah, he got a terrific jump. No advance further for Diazza. He stops at second base after the steal. So into scoring position with his 17th theft of the year. Are you talking about Gordon Beckham before the game? He had an interesting note. Well, yeah, I, I was kidding him because I knew he's mar marrying Scott Fletcher's daughter. And um, I said, did, did you look at the wedding invitation list? He said, yeah, and yes. Well, George Bush, George W. Bush's favorite player in his time as owner was always Scott Fletcher. He named his dog Spot Fletcher after him. So I kind of figured... Um, there was a very good chance that the Fletchers would invite George W. and Laura Bush. They have. So on November 9th, um, I, I hope that uh, everything is well with uh, uh, GW's health. And he said he, he goes for the wedding. <laughs> two balls, two strikes here to Gordon Beckham. That's sort of the second look out at second base, and he'll miss low and away. What can you expect from a gift? From a yeah, former that's a, president. That's a great question. That's, that's a, I would have high hopes. Air Force One for a week. <laughs> 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 Alejandro Diaz at second base. Nobody out here as the White Sox bat in the top of the first. And Dempster taking a long time here going back and forth with Salt and Lamaki as to what to throw. And that's ball four. Down to first base goes Beckham. So I wondered about a little bit of the rust factor for Dempster tonight in this long layoff, and he's walked the first two batters that he's faced in the game. He'll get set for every Red Sox game on Nessa with Red Sox Game Day Live, presented by DCU. Nessa's pregame coverage of the Sox begins an hour before every game. DCU, Digital Federal Credit Union, banking the DCU way. Two on, nobody out. Alexei Ramirez as part of this lineup, batting third now for the White Sox in their order. Generally, we saw him near the bottom of the lineup, sometimes in the middle, but uh, here he is batting third for a team that's struggling offensively a little bit, at least has been over the last couple of weeks, started to pick it up. Ramirez on the ground, possibly two. Drew to second for one, on to first for two. Well, Dempster needed that. Taking advantage of a guy that does swing at everything. Well, Taylor made there with Drew headed towards the bag. It's second. And you see Beckham coming in hard, but not even close to Pedroia. Didn't have to leap out of the way. 
They're in the 6 4 3 twin killing as Diazza now at third base with two down. Brings up Adam Dunn. 30 home runs on the year for Dunn. 79 runs batted in and a 231 batting average coming in. All kinds of power as we have seen in the past. He's always been the all or nothing guy, Don. Lots of strikeouts, lots of power, lots of walks. I've had only 11 home runs in his first year after signing with the White Sox. Bounced back to have 41 last year. And this year at 30 home runs at the moment. And a swing and a miss, one and one. Most, most of his years in the majors with the Cincinnati Reds. And swings over the top of the slider that time from Dempster. See his career numbers 436 home runs in 1800 games for Adam Dunn. Strike two. Well, Dempster could get out of this inning unscathed. It'd be big for him and his confidence out of the gate. That was a good pitch. Came inside, got the benefit of the doubt of the inside corner. Side for ball two. I could get Adam Dunn having more career home runs than Jim Rice, but when I saw that Alfonso Soriano has more home That's runs than Jim Rice, I went. It was about four o'clock in the morning. I went. I better go get some more coffee. I'm having trouble with this. He just got his 400th. Yes, yeah. last week, right? Might be a little different era. Two two pitch in the dirt and a full count. Seems like a terrific. Decision for the Yankees in Alfonso Soriano. So wait at four in the morning. Were you just getting up or were you just going? No, to I, bed? Was, I was definitely getting up. <laughs> I was reading about Soriano's 400. It's always a great guy. and He's played really hard for the Yankees, but Jim Rice. <laughs> Peter is one of the few people I know who gets up at four o'clock in the morning and researches. <laughs> he does this on a regular basis every day. I think just about they thought so. <laughs> Three two pitch. Swing and a miss, and Dempster does get out of the first inning unscathed. It's that slider again. The Red Sox are coming up. Back at Fenway Park. 
Well, the Red Sox starting nine is brought to you by New England Chevy dealers as leading it off is Jacoby Ellsbury in center field with Shane Victorino in right, Dustin Bedroy at second base, David Ortiz at DH, Johnny Gomes in left, Mike Napoli at first base, Jared Saltalamacchia doing the catching, batting seventh, and Stephen Drew at short, and Will Middlebrooks at third base rounds out the starting nine. Ellsbury shortening it up, but taking strike one. Well, the starting pitcher for the White Sox, Hector Santiago. His number is brought to you by Nissan. 31st appearance, 20th start, 4 and 7. 26 strikeouts for him and a 234 opponent batting average. Did you get a feel one way or another as to the situation with Jacoby Ellsbury and his future with the Red Sox beyond this year? Well, he and Scott Boris have said all the right things, but when it comes down to, um, I want to see. In the middle of January, or actually probably the middle of December, because I don't think the Red Sox will wait until until February to do something. Whether Scott is going to go for something less than six and eighteen. And I have general managers saying it is not a chance in the world he comes back, but I, he does really like it here. It's a great place to play and. So it is a factor you think in his eyes that playing in Boston could be important to him. Yes. And I think Dustin Pedroia talks to him about it all the time too. So it's I mean but it there is something to be said. I mean you you want money but do you want it to be happy. I mean when Pedroia took some criticism over signing what was a quote below market contract. I mean part of the reason you want the money is to be able to live where you want to live and play for whom you want to play. And this is where he wants to be. We've seen Boris clients do that sometimes before, but have they ever done it when they finally got out to free agency? Usually that happens before. Swing and a miss in Santiago on a 93 mile an hour fastball strikes out Jacoby Ellsbury. For the first out here in the bottom of the first inning, let's check out the White Sox defensively. Brought to you by Verizon Fios. Chuck Evinger at third base, Alexei Ramirez at short, Gordon Beckham at second, Paul Canerco at first. Left to right of the outfield, Diana Viciedo in left, Alejandro Diaz in center, obviously Al Garcia in right. Josh Fegley does the catching for Hector Santiago. One out of the inning. Torino at 294 with 12 homers and 50 runs batted in. And John makes a good point. It does seem uh, most of the time that uh, he likes to check out that market value. No question. I mean, one of the cases where a guy signed for less than Scott Foley should have signed for was Jared Weaver. Mm -hmm. But that was before he hit free agency. And Jared lives like 20 minutes from, from the ballpark in Anaheim. I mean, I, I get it. I think back to Jason Baratek. He was a Boris guy. There was no chance he was ever going anywhere, but he did it long before he got onto the open market. One one pitch will miss, and it is two and one. And Victorino in August at 318, with seven home runs and 21 runs batted in. He's settling on that right side against right handers, but certainly there tonight against the lefty. And he fouls this back two and two. Well, tonight we recognize Shane Victorino for going the Firestone complete extra mile in his first 71 games of the season. He hit a respectable 274, five home runs and a 388 slugging percentage. But in his last 28, has been soaring for the Sox, hitting at 342, seven home runs. This is effort recognized by Firestone to know what it's like to help drivers go the extra mile. A beautiful night here tonight at Fenway Park for game one of this weekend series against the White Sox. Is that somebody wearing the uniform for Ted Williams' birthday? Yeah, that's right. It is today, is it not? Out near the red seat in the bleachers as pitch misses to Shane Victorino. He would have been today what age? Let's see, was it 1918 when he was born? I'm not sure. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. 
Three two is going to miss and Victorino is aboard. One out walk. At 95 he would have been. That's right. So a one out base runner and it'll bring up Dustin Pedroia. We were talking to John Henry last night and as he joined us in the booth if there was one guy that you're going to give the money in years to based on the last few years and now trying to stay away from long term contracts uh, that did not work here in the last couple of years. This was sort of the guy you're going to give it to if there was one guy. I, I think and I, I know that Ben Charrington's had very strong feeling about if you want someone to be the face of your franchise the way he pushes I mean, the way they do infield every day the way he pushes other players I mean they're I've seen them all. I don't see another team that goes at him at 3.30 in the afternoon with intense infield the way the Red Sox do. And that was Alex Cora passing it down to Dustin Bedoya. And really he's forcing it on everyone, which is a great thing of leadership. Brian Butterfield may be the best coach in baseball, but you need a, a Dustin Bedoya to be able to, to, to really facilitate it. And throw the first in. Victorino back to the bag. That really is about setting and maintaining the culture. But the other interesting thing is the back end of that contract looks fairly team friendly, which I think is a big part of it. And certainly Dustin understanding the value of what it's like to play here on a daily basis. You can tell he didn't want to go anywhere else. Drives this deep and far, but will it stay fair? No. Not ahead of that one. Traveled a great distance, but to the left of the ball. And I think it was also interesting to hear Pedroia himself talk about that. He didn't want to put the team in a position where they couldn't have flexibility to put good players around them. The check on Victorino, very short lead back to the back. It is amazing how he gets here earlier than anybody else. He's in the dugout in his uniform, ready to go every day at like two o'clock. <laughs> he always is able to have his son Dylan come down and yes. spend a little time with him on the field. It's wonderful. There goes Victorino on the 2 1. Pitches outside and high, and the throw is going to be not in time. The tag was high. And getting in feet first apparently was Victorino the throw beat him is going to bring Robin Ventura out to argue but so far Beckham is not arguing. Now Fegley the catcher is frustrated he can't figure out how that didn't beat him. You're right Don though the throw got there before Victorino's foot got to the back. He didn't tag him. Back and just missed the tag. You know, and I'm, I'm glad to see that too because so many times you'll see an umpire when the throw beats him, boom, out. No questions asked. They didn't give the benefit of the doubt that time. Just the high tag when the mm -hmm. foot's in first. I like Angel Hernandez. When we don't have to bash Angel Hernandez, yes. I'm happy. It's I really a good like thing. the guy. <laughs> He's had his shares of dust ups over the years with people. He's had a few. Yeah. <laughs> Robin Ventura was not animated. And again, really, Gordon Beckham sort of seemed to know that he was late on the tag. Stolen base for Victorino. Counts three and one to Pedroia. 103rd stolen base on the year for the Red Sox. They're third in the American League in that category. Largely because they get the league leader in stolen bases in Jacoby Ellsbury, who now has 50. Pedroia fouls it back, full count. Seven batters in this game and six full counts so far. Right. Being the two starters right out of the gate. Santiago is going to about, about to throw his 20th pitch. He's got only one out in the inning. 
Dempster had to throw 20 in the first on his side of things and had a double play and a strikeout to help him out. Fouls back another. I've often thought, you know, where they have the pitch counts up on the scoreboard, they ought to have the they have, have lights, and by as they get up over 85, they start they go to uh, to yellow and they start flashing, <laughs> <laughs> like an alert. Yeah, the hundred is coming. You know, 20 already for Santiago, the 25-year-old left-hander. Overall, his 31st appearance, 20th start of the season. No grounder foul this time to the end of the White Sox dugout. He's pitched 130 innings, too, this year, Don. I'm wondering how far they'll let him go. He worked pretty much as a reliever last year. He worked a little bit out of the pen this year as well. But you wonder if they have an innings limit in mind for him. Don Cooper, the very good pitching coach for the White Sox. Produced some very good pitching staffs over the years. White Sox with a 3.83 earned run average, kind of in the middle of the pack this year from an ERA standpoint. And a foul is fighting off another is Pedroia. This at bat will extend to a ninth pitch. I did something with Don Cooper and Juan Yevis this afternoon, which will be on tomorrow night but, uh, on the pregame. Because they're, they're very close, and Juan was, Cooper was great to Juan Yevis. So I explained that beforehand Cooper is Plato and Yevis is Aristotle. <laughs> <laughs> Pitch is just going to miss. More visibly frustrated is Hector Santiago. He thought he had strike three. In fact, he's thought he's had a couple of pitches. In this first, but ends up walking Pedroia on the ninth pitch of the at bat from a 3 2 changeup. That's pretty close. And that's a pitcher's pitch. Pitcher wants that pitch. It's not that different from the pitch Dempster got as a called strike in the top half of the inning. So now trying to work his way around two walks is Santiago. Two on, one away. And then it brings up David Ortiz. 310, 24 homers, 79 runs batted in for David, who right now is in the midst of a very tough stretch. He is old for his last 22. And Peter, I guess anytime you get your big slugger going 0 for 22, there has to be some concern. There is. I think that he he really believes that his timing is off, that he's lost some sense of his strike zone. And it's just one of those things. I think probably the back you know, caused some of that concern. Probably got his mechanics out of whack. He didn't seem at all concerned about it this afternoon, so we shall see. Yeah, take strike one. Even with the 0 for 22, the batting average at 310 coming into tonight's action gives you an idea what kind of season this guy has put together. And he bats here with Victorino at second, Pedroia at first, one down. And it might help him to see a couple of left handers and start going back the other way a little bit more. Broken bat, grounder that is knocked down by Beckham. He will go to third base and they'll get the force out there of Victorino. He wasn't sure and was about halfway. And Beckham looked up and found out he could fire to third base, get the lead runner. A really no man's land there for Victorino. Not a lot he could do. He broke back towards second when it appeared that Beckham had a chance to catch the ball off the ground, but kind of just a tough break for the base runner. Sounded like Ortiz broke his bat. And Victorino retired at third base for the second out of the inning. So the Red Sox have two on with two outs. And it'll bring up Johnny Gomes. Mike Carp on the shelf uh, listed as day to day. Of course, the lefty going anyway. This would have been Gomes' game to start. One of the things that we were talking about this afternoon while Gomes was hitting is that he just 
different things with each round of BP that he takes. And his final one, he practices runner on second, two outs, and just tries to hit line drives up the middle. It's I've never quite seen anybody go at batting practice have totally different approaches for each round that he that he has. But his last one is always get the runner in from second with two outs. We'll see if he can get it done here with two down and Pedroia at second base. Here are the numbers in scoring position for Johnny Gomes. 350. Three homers and 30 runs batted in. Seems to lock in in this situation as he takes ball one. He looks a little bit like an NHL player in about round three of the playoffs. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and he's not alone in that category on this roster. It's been a growing trend. And there's some good ones. You had a pretty good one a couple years ago. <laughs> it is a pop up left side of the infield. From short comes Ramirez, and much like Dempster, Santiago able to work his way around some damage in the first. We're scoreless after one. Deep into that pitch count in the first inning as Dempster had to throw 20 first inning pitches and Santiago 27 first inning pitches, but we are scoreless to the second inning. Paul Canerco, Abisiel Garcia, and Jeff Kepinger. Peter, the waiver wire situation coming to an end here soon as far as trades being able to be made. Do you see the Red Sox doing anything? Only I think for a relief pitcher if there's somebody out there. The problem is that National League Pittsburgh, American League Baltimore claim so many players. We were all kidding yesterday. What happens if teams like the Twins just say to the Orioles, here, you can have the guys? They'd have like a 58 man roster. <laughs> Canerco flies out to center field for the first out here of the second inning. There are only two homestands remaining this season, but you still have a chance to see your Red Sox at Fenway Park. Sox will play the White Sox through the weekend, then battle the Detroit Tigers next week. Get your tickets now for these great matchups by calling 877-RED SOX-9 online at redsox.com slash tickets or visit the Fenway Park ticket office. One out here in the top of the second inning. Number CL Garcia last year appeared in the postseason with the Detroit Tigers. Made available by the Tigers. White Sox take him. We'll see the 292 with three homers and 19 runs batted in. A 
Well, it's been a disappointing season for the White Sox. Here's Kenny Williams, the general manager of the Chicago White Sox. Had some very good years in Chicago. Things are a little quieter these days without Ozzie Guillen around, that's for sure. No reality television this year. <laughs> Actually, don't miss that show too much. <laughs> They won 85 games last year. Now the only team in the American League with more losses is Houston. Now that's deceptive. I mean, Houston's a lot worse, and they're close to catching maybe the Twins. But it's been a disappointing year to say the least. Two one is chopped towards third base, but that'll kick foul. It's been quiet. Been a lot different. But uh, Robin Ventura seems very, I mean, he still loves managing. He wants to stay, and I, I think it's almost certain that he will. Jerry Reinsdorf is famous for his loyalty, but uh, I think that they really think by getting the Garcias, by getting a little bit younger and starting to transition the team, that they think maybe they could move in the right direction. I mean, look at the success that some guys who have become managers. Who have not had a lot of managing experience, really done quite well. Robin Ventura here, and of course, uh, Mike Matheny comes to mind with the St. Yeah. Louis Cardinals. Oh, no doubt. It can be done. It certainly can be done. And what about Jason Veritek someday, perhaps, making that jump? Yeah, I just, the only thing that worries me is that he would be too hard on himself. But I worry about that with Matheny, too. 2 2. He's a swing and a miss, and Garcia strikes out, climb the ladder. And a 91 mile an hour fastball. It's the second strikeout for Dempster. That pitch was not a strike. It was above the zone, but so tempting, so tantalizing up there near the chin. The Jonah Nesson is brought to you by Amica. Amica Insurance, great service, great coverage, and a great price for auto, home, or life insurance. Two down in the second inning. Jeff Kepinger. Veteran hitting at 251. Four homers and 36 runs batted in. Mentioned Garcia going to the White Sox. Of course, that was part of the Jake Peavy, Jose Iglesias deal. He was the third part of that deal. And that was a fascinating trade when was. you think about it. I mean, it's, you know, the White Sox got what they were looking for. The Tigers, of course, without Peralta, got what they were looking for. And the Red Sox got the veteran starting pitcher they could pitch right down the stretch and into the postseason if need be. So. A Gar logical trade. Garcia was rated very highly in terms mm -hmm. of prospects in the in their system. I think number two ranking in the Tigers system. So that gives you an idea of how Detroit identified what they needed and how much they were willing to pay for it. And of course with Johnny Peralta going on the suspended list they certainly needed a shortstop and chose to go the defensive route in that regard. Certainly have enough offense in the Tigers yes, lineup. They do. I mean, Peralta was an important guy because he could hit six behind Victor Martinez and really give them offense. So they're a little weak, four through nine, but. Nick Evinger is thrown out by Stephen Drew. Mike Napoli is leading it off when we come back to the fans.
at Fenway Park and has featured the Bruins and Hockey East teams. And today, the announcement came out that Frozen Fenway will feature college hockey once again with Hockey East doubleheaders on January 4th and the 11th. And that brings us to our AT&T text poll question of the night. We want to know which one of these non-baseball events are your favorite to enjoy here at Fenway Park. So text or vote to 536-536. Select A for the Fenway Concert Series, B for Frozen Fenway, C for Picnic in the Park, and D for the Run to Home Base. Message and data rates may apply. You can vote throughout this entire game, our post-game coverage, and we'll reveal the winners on Nesson Sports Today. Don? All right, Jane, thank you very much. Tough to beat Frozen Fenway. Uh, John Rich, I know you were the voice of Boston College Hockey for a long time. Did you get to do a Frozen Fenway? I did. You know what it was like, Don? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. I, I never was, got here. For... I was right here a few years ago. It was the BCBU game, a couple booths down, and it was freezing. It, wasn't ra- it was raining, too, that night, wasn't it? Uh, it might have been. Yeah, they were very concerned about the condition of the ice. That's always a big concern. And to me, what was unbelievable about that, is it spoke so much about Fenway Park, the rivalry, but still they drew 39,000 for that game. <laughs> I mean, that's unbelievable on a Thursday night. You know, Mike Napoli leading it off, takes a pitch inside. Of course, the Flyers and Bruins also played here. But as I recall, at least it was snowing during your game, right? At some point, they had, they had some elements, too. They did. They had a little bit of snow. And um, we, we left the windows closed. Uh-huh. Do you want to get a feel for the park? <laughs> no, we have effects mics for that. Well, Mike Napoli hitting at 248 coming into tonight's game. Batting out of the number six spot in the Red Sox order. Be followed by Salta Lamacchia and Stephen Drew in the inning. Another strike full count. Not sure where the best seat is, though, for hockey at Fenway. And the park, the, the rink, if you think about it, it basically stretches right across the infield almost, covers up where second base would be. So it's right out there in the middle. This is a pretty good vantage point. I would think it'd be kind of far. Napoli. It is. Numbers wise, as Napoli strikes out, that's the second strikeout. Fastball that time from Santiago. And so he gets Napoli to begin the second inning. Right on the inside corner. Uh, framed by Fegley, the catcher. San Diego has been really good. Be able to use both sides of the plate, pitching inside to Ortiz, inside to to, uh, to Gomes, inside to Napoli. It's it's been very impressive how he's used his fastball. Well, he's got the first out here, the second inning for Jared Saltalamacchia. He'll take strike one. It's been amazing how much Jared has caught this season for the Red Sox. It's really not the blueprint to begin the year. And of course, the injuries to David Ross, namely the concussions, keeping out of the lineup a lot for the Red Sox. Ryan LeBarnway was here for a while, and as a result, Saltalamaki doing a lot more catching. And I thought Saltalamaki struggled towards the end of last year, and I think a lot of that had to do with the workload, which I think in turn makes it more impressive the workload that he's been able to assume this year and still produce. He did not like DHing. He did a lot of DHing in the second half, but I am, you may feel this way too, Don, but I think he's been one of the most improved players on the team. I would agree. This one is out to right center, and Diaz is there to make the catch for the second out here, the second inning. Well, on Sunday's all new Ultimate Red Sox show presented by Triple A, Jenny brings you all the highlights from the 12th annual WEI Ness and Jimmy Fund Radio Telethon. Catch a full recap of another successful Jimmy Fund year and more on the Ultimate Red Sox show on Sunday at noon. Generally, Peter Gammons is on the Ultimate Red Sox show. He's on there a lot. Tune in on Sundays. A lot of good interviews this year. It's been fun. I love doing the interviews. I mean, I, that's something I really enjoy. And, and uh, people have been great about it. But I'll tell you, that haven't been too many better than Xander Bogarts. And of course... Having grown up the son of a teacher, when I asked him, you know, when you're done, have you ever thought about what you would want to do? Oh, definitely, I want to go back and be a teacher because I am where I am today because of teachers. I want. No, I really love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's been fun to watch so far, and you can tell that there is so much ahead of Xander Bogarts. I tell you what's really impressed me about him is, I mean, he's a big guy, six three. He's going to be two hundred pounds, but. He plays like, I mean, defensively, 
He's very compact. He reminds me his actions are those not of a long arm, long legged guy, but of a guy about 5'10. It's really interesting. He's so different offensively than he is defensively. He's very compact defensively. Stephen Drew batting with two down here in the second inning. Pops it up, sending the second baseman Beckham out to right center field. Now coming from right, look out, and not catching it is Garcia. Uh, trouble written all over it once Beckham peeled it away. It looked like ballet. <laughs> it wasn't pretty, whatever it was. I'm, I'm thinking that's a center fielder's ball. I mean, it's not Beckham's ball, and the way he veered off, somebody must have been calling. You assume it's Garcia, but that spot in the field, I'm thinking center fielder's got to catch that ball. Yeah, Garcia coming full bore. He was doing a Yassiel plea. Everybody <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> right, come. Like Garcia must have called for it because watch, yeah. Diaz just stops, looks over, but Diaz could have made that catch. Very easily. It is ruled a base hit. No contact there with the gloves, it turns out, for Garcia. So Drew will take it. It's the first hit for either side in this game. And it gives Will Middlebrooks a chance. Here you're talking about Will Middlebrooks as part of the open and the changes that he has made since returning from Pawtucket. Give him a lot of credit. He told me, you know, just fine, okay, it's time for me to figure it out. And he, he, he shortened the leg kick. He got much flatter. He sees the ball better. He uses the whole field. And as he was telling me today, this. Remember, he had back problems earlier in the season, and he said by reducing the amount of movement and the, 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 reducing the violence in his swing, in his approach, it's really helped his back. And you see the numbers that bear that out, hitting a 346 cents returning. When he first arrived on the scene, and from what we saw from him last year, to a lot of comparisons, I thought, to Evan Longoria. Could he be as good as Evan Longoria? That's a tough comparison to live up to. But boy, he did burst onto the scene in that fashion. You're right about that. Limited number of games, total 75 games last year. Did not start well this year. And he'll chop this one towards second base. Beckham will go to second on the force out that ends the inning. We're through two from Fenway without a score. Drew gets credit for that base hit as we move into the third and leading it off here for the White Sox, Diane Viciato. 
It's a strike one from Ryan Dempster at a much better second inning. After walking the first two batters he faced tonight in the first, able to get a double play and a strikeout, and now has retired five batters in a row. Kind of wonder about uh, Dempster's future when Buckholz comes back and who comes out of the rotation if you get towards the end of the year in this. Three starts it appears Buckholz could make prior to the postseason, perhaps here in Boston. They absolutely have to get. If Buckholz comes through the the uh, minor league rehab period, healthy, self confident, they have to get him innings before the postseason because he's going to have to be one, two, three in the rotation. It's a one foul back and it's two and two. It is a nice problem to have, though, isn't it? Yes. One too many guys for a rotation, especially in September when you don't have to worry about roster spots. Buckholz, by the way, finished his start tonight for Pawtucket. Three and a third, a run on seven hits, no walks, two Ks. His second rehab appearance. We'll have at least one more, it appears. Two twos on the ground to third base. Middlebrook's on the backhand for the first out of the third inning. Ever find yourself guessing what you think is going to happen during every at bat? Well, there's an app for that. MLB Preplay is the official prediction game of Major League Baseball, and it's free to download on iOS and Android. Download now at Nesson.com slash preplay and play along during every Red Sox game. Of course, we we tend to overlook John Lackey as a postseason stalwart because mm -hmm. as amazing statistic that baseball analytics I came up with for me the other day, and that is they had Swing and miss percentage of pitchers after they got over the 100 pitch mark. He was fourth in baseball in swing and misses. And, and one of the theories is that that John Farrell and, and Juan Yavis do such a good job letting pitchers know exactly what they're doing. He knows when it's going to be his final inning. We know he throws strikes and he he dials into that inning like he's a closer. But it's amazing that you think a guy 34 years old coming off Tommy John would have the fourth highest swing and miss percentage after 100 pitches. Swing and a miss here for Fegley batting with one out of the inning. That was a great pitch. Breaking ball. And it was what we really never saw from Lackey until this season, which tells you he was never healthy. One two pitch, a swing and a miss, and Dempster picks up his third strikeout. This is second out here of the third inning. And continuing with Lackey, can you recall at least recently another Red Sox player that has had their perception change so much in just a short period of time? No. Five months. It's pretty it's, quick. It is amazing. I mean, having been around the team a lot, I knew how players respected him. I understood that one year when he has his personal problems, he was obviously really hurting. And uh, it's everything kind of walled up against him. But uh, in the clubhouse, he was always a, a guy that was really well respected. That's the thing. I think that's the important thing was during the entire time while well, he was kind of taking it. The, the team was there for him. And at the same time, the year that he spent injured coming back uh, from the surgery, he was with the team every day, home man road during that entire season. 1 0 pitch is going to miss 2 0. Three strikeouts now for Dempster through two and two thirds innings. Off the thumbs, a soft line drive to second base. Pedroia reels in. It's a one, two, three, third through two and a half. We'll see Jacoby Ellsbury lead it off when we come back.
base paths of the Red Sox. Jacoby Ellsbury. Ellsbury stole his 50th base of the season in last night's game against the Orioles. Becomes only the second player since 2008 to have 50 or more steals in three seasons. Joining Cleveland's Michael Moore, who did it while playing with the Astros and the Braves. Ellsbury will lead it off here in the bottom of the third inning. He'll be struck out swinging in the first inning. One of two strikeouts for Hector Santiago on the night. Ellsbury started the night hitting at 299. He's been teetering around 300 for the bulk of the season. And Sox only have one hit so far off Santiago through the first two innings. Ooh, swing and a miss. And it's good that he's been in the lineup the last couple of days. He came out of the game the other night. And, of course, the first thing you think about is how valuable he is to this team at the top of the lineup. But he's been very durable this year. Ooh, drop in there for strike two. Right where that uh, shield would not protect him, as it turned out. Top of his foot. O two is going to miss one and two. Well, the Tampa Bay Rays begin a West Coast swing. It's going to be very difficult for the Rays and tonight they open up against the Oakland A's. Two wild card leaders going head to head tonight. Out West. Two and two. Yeah, meanwhile the Rangers are going to be home tonight against the Twins. And that's significant, at least from a Red Sox perspective, what the Rangers do, because right now Texas is just a sliver ahead of Boston for the best record in the American League. Ellsbury sprays it foul off to the left, and we'll do it again, two and two. How valuable do you think that is, getting that top spot, the top seed, so you get the wild card winner coming off that one-game playoff? I think it's valuable because the other team has to use its best pitcher in, in the wild card game and then move on from there. It's 2 2 is on the ground to third base. Kepinger's got it. And the throw is just in time to get Ellsbury at first base in the first out of the third inning. Yeah, Peter, a whole new dynamic now, having to worry about that one game. I mean, you really would like to win the division at all costs so you don't end up in that situation where it's one game. It's a little bit like March Madness. I mean, that was the idea. You have play, you have a play-in game, but you also have elimination games. And I, one of the theories in entertainment is the more elimination games you have, the better the audience. So, mm -hmm. but it's not too good if you happen to be on a team that's going to play a one-game play, like the Rangers last year losing to the Orioles. Now, I, I get it from a marketing perspective. That makes perfect sense. But if I was one of those teams, I wouldn't like it one bit. 162 games, and then your whole season weighs on one game. It just doesn't translate to baseball like it does to college basketball. No, I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, UNC Asheville playing against, <laughs> <laughs> playing against Kentucky. On the ground and by the dive with Kepinger who's in at the lip of the grass at third base. And Victorino is aboard for the second time tonight. First hit he's got. Well, Kepinger was in at third and quickly by him. Shane Victorino getting on again. Second hit of the night for Boston. I'd like to see a three-game series. I mean, I think that would be okay. I don't really want to see baseball and snowflakes in the middle of November. Well, you're pushing towards November is where that's, you go. I mean, that's that's the other concern is the schedule. How do you squeeze all that in, and how do you make a team wait? Well, another two teams play a three-game series, so there are problems no matter how you look at it. Not waiting is a problem. We saw with the Colorado yeah. Rockies in 2007. Absolutely, it wasn't a hotter team in baseball. They had to win 21 out of 23 to even get to the one-game playoff against the Padres that year. And then by the time they get through the playoffs to play the Red Sox in the World Series, what do they sit around? Seven days? Eight days? Yes. And we'll look at the wild card standings heading into tonight's action. Again, the A's and Rays play each other. <clears throat> I do not count the Orioles out. There's something about the indomitable spirit of that team that fascinates me. And I know you are a Buck Showalter fan as well. Uh, and the players on that team, I mean, Chris Davis and Adam Jones and J.J. Hardy. I, 
The other day, I'm out here about 1.30 in the afternoon, and they had some of their extra guys taking BP, which, you know, first time in Fenway for a couple of them. I said, well, who are those four guys out in the outfield shagging? And the players said, well, four clubhouse kids, and the team, the players chipped in to take them on the trip to Boston, New York, and Cleveland, gave them the meal money. Players paid for the whole thing just because they're clubhouse kids. Nice guys. It's hard to root against a team like that. I'll tell you, I was very impressed with Tillman last night. And you yes. and Eck talked about it. That was a big spot for Tillman. They were staring at a sweep, and Tillman came up big for them. He could be a real weapon. I think the Mariners like to have that Eric Bedard, oh. Chris Tillman, <laughs> Adam, Adam Jones. Jones deal back. Even George Sherrill was in the mix of that. Good for the Orioles for a while. And is there a closer? I just wonder about the Orioles starting pitching. I do, too. But it, this whole ridiculous... The set of rules. They started Chen here on Tuesday. They could start him again on Sunday because they could option the Gulf Coast League for one day because their schedule's over and they can bring him back so they don't have to wait 10 days to bring him back. Oh, I wonder if he enjoyed thinking about the Gulf Coast League. <laughs> that flight mysteriously was canceled. On the outside corner to Pedroia, and it is two and two. Ellsbury grounded out to begin the inning. Shane Victorino singles to left, and now Pedroia had a lengthy at bat before walking in the first inning as a two and two count. 57 pitches for Santiago through two and a third innings. Popped up. Left side of the infield as Alexei Ramirez backpedals and makes the catch for the second out of the inning. Well, tonight's Twisted But True Fact looks at the Orioles' Chris Tillman. Tillman scattered six hits over seven innings last night, allowing two earned runs to notch his 15th win of the season. First Orioles pitcher to get 15 wins since Eric Bedard did so in 2006. Ironically, Tillman was part of the multi player deal the Orioles acquired when they traded away Eric Bedard back in 2008. Twisted Tea Art Ice Tea is the refreshing hard ice tea. It tastes like real ice tea. Be a little twisted. I thought one of the important things for the Orioles here to maybe get Jim Johnson back thinking, you know, okay, every ground ball is going to go through the, through the infield. I thought the, the Mattis pitching to David Ortiz was really significant. So maybe you know, they picked up Mike Morse from Seattle today. And, um, you know, knowing how great that ballpark in that city is, it's fun to see some excitement around the Orioles. Last well, year was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, that was a team that did so many things. They had to have it all line up. So many one game, one run victories as well as walk off wins last year. And then to get by the one game playoff against Texas Rangers in advance. Great to see in Baltimore. A great baseball city. Ortiz takes a strike and it's one and one. That's a tough pitch. I mean, it's probably outside. That's really not a strike. It's close, but for the way things have been going for Poppy right now, it seems like they're all like that. Plus, the way he's used both sides of the plate, I think, has expanded a little bit for him. They've tired of waiting. Backs out. Now back in again. Outside for ball two. And Don, to your point at the top of the broadcast, even with the recent struggles, you look at his season on a whole, and it's extremely impressive. I mean, obviously the average, the home runs, all of that are there. One of the things that really jumps out at me is how low his strikeout percentage is. Mm -hmm. and, and it was good last year as well, but well below his career number. Outside for ball three is ahead three and one. And there's a pattern there. Every pitch has been low and away. I'll tell you the stats amaze me is that Chris Davis is going to strike out over 200 times and is hitting over 300. That's hard to do. Be the fifth man in history. 3-1 pitch is going to miss and Ortiz will take the walk. He's on down to first base. That is the third walk surrendered by Hector Santiago in his outing. 
Well, the overhead views tonight are provided by the Hood Blimp. In the summer try new Hood Harvey bars. Each bar is made with creamy Hood ice cream and is covered in a rich chocolate coating. Learn more at Hood.com. The Red Sox have had runners on in every inning. And they have two on here in the third with two outs as Johnny Gomes at the plate came up with two on in the first inning. Gomes popped out to the shortstop Alexei Ramirez to end the inning. Look out. Gomes gets hit with the first pitch. A two mile an hour fastball that will load the bases. I think it got him on the on the forearm. Uh, lower. Right on the front knee. So Johnny Gomes aboard at first base, hit by a pitcher to bring the pitching coach Don Cooper out. We really talked about Don Cooper a lot over the years. Likes to have his starters work quickly, and we saw Mark Burley do that quite a bit in his years there. And, a lot of success for Cooper and you mentioned the relationship that he has with Juan Nieves and the Evis having been the bullpen coach for the White Sox. What a great job Juan Nieves has done for the Red Sox. Great. <clears throat> um, actually once wrote a story about him at Avon Old Farms 30 years ago. So I've known him for a while <laughs> when he and Brian Leach were the two best pitchers for, uh, for Avon. But he, he said to me the day he got the job he said you know I think it's really important for a pitching coach to understand how to use a bullpen. And he learned that not only with Don, but by being in the White Sox bullpen all those years. And I think it's well, what we've seen with what, the way Farrell and Yavis uh, have handled the bullpen. It's been amazing. Could be viewed as a very difficult job being the pitching coach for a successful former pitching coach. Mm -hmm. and John Farrell certainly was. Bases loaded two down for Mike Napoli. Struck out looking in the second inning. They want almost hit him on a pitch down and in. Some of these pitches here from Santiago have not been close. Now he was all over the place, missing low and away to Ortiz. He hits Gomes in the first pitch, and that one nearly forced home a run. And you can see <laughs> Cooper's expression. Cooper's Says so it all. He is so funny. <laughs> The 1 0. Not close to an 0. He's definitely a little bit unglued right here. And two outs with the runner at first. He walked Ortiz, hits Gomes, and falls behind Napoli 2 0. <laughs> 3 0. That was the closest he's been in a while. No place to put Mike Napoli with a count three and zero, two down. There is a strike. Right down the middle, three and one. Napoli with two grand slams to his credit this year, 471 average in this position. Victorino, Ortiz, and Gomes fill up the bases with two down. Ball four. Red Sox take a one nothing lead. Santiago walks in a run. Fourth walk of his outing, second of the inning, and Boston on top, one nothing, and Don Cooper on the phone. All right, we're going to see action now in the bullpen. And when you look at Santiago, he's completely lost the strike zone. Yeah, the first pitch was a breaking ball, not close, and then he was upstairs. I think that might have been a changeup. The only thing that was there was the to get me over fastball on three and zero. Oh. That's a great that was a great sequence because you can see there was no rhyme or reason in that in that sequence. Well, this is high for ball one. 
Jared Salt to Lamakia. Fly out to center field to Alejandro Diaz in the second inning. Chance to do some damage here in this third inning. 2 and 0. No reason to swing right now if you're a Red Sox batter. Any more painful by the second for Don Cooper. It is. This is really hard to watch. Jake Patricio warming in the pen. There's a swing and a miss for Salt and Lamaki, and it's now two and one. Mr. Mass Lexus dealers bring you the pitching line for Hector Santiago two and two thirds is two hits one run but he's walked four. 36 balls to 36 strikes. And Salta Lamacchia gets time. Down and in, three and one. How fast can Petrichka get ready? That's the question. Because if he's ready in time, this could be the last batter for Santiago. He is going to check right now. Find out about his availability. Oh, I thought he was calling Santiago a cab. <laughs> Swing and a miss, and a full count now. Both of the pitches that Saltalaki has swung at have been strikes. So you think when a guy is all over the place, you don't want to help him out. But both of those pitches, they've been up a little bit in the zone, but they've both been strikes. If he gets out of this giving up one run, that is pretty a impressive. Minor, a minor miracle. Three, two. And a pop-up. Looks like he's going to get out of it. From third comes Keppinger. Canerco from first. Look out. It's Keppinger. Makes the catch. And somehow Santiago gets out of the inning, giving up just the one run. Peter Gammons, thanks for being Thank with us. Thank you very much. It's great fun. Great to be with you, John. Bank, you always put others first. Wouldn't it be nice if your bank did the same thing with products that make life easier and a commitment to helping those in need? Here, your first Eastern Bank. 
Well, the Red Sox have a one nothing advantage as Ryan Dempster returns to the mound here for the top half of the fourth inning. Gordon Beckham leading it off and it is truly remarkable. The Red Sox are only able to get one run out of that last inning. Dare to call it a squander. Hector Santiago is all over the place. And the last out was a bit of an event, but in the end, the job was done by Kepinger coming from third base. This had trouble written all over it right out of the gate. And I think one of the difficult things for Kepinger is the way he had to go up on the side of the mound. That made the play that much more difficult. 2 0 pitch popped up, foul off to the right. Second time tonight, though, we've seen a seemingly innocent pop up create problems. Now, the other one was in very shallow right center field, but. You might wonder why have the White Sox lost 76 games. That could be part of the problem. Now only the Angels and Astros have committed more errors than the White Sox have this season. Beckham Ramirez and Dunn to bat here in the fourth inning. John Risch alongside tonight here at Fenway Park. Our thanks to Hall of Famer Peter Gammons. Joining us for the first three innings of tonight's contest. Beckham walked in the first inning. And it's a liner to short. It's picked on the backhand by Drew. What a good jump moves over and makes the grab and robs Beckham of a base hit. For the first out of the fourth inning. That's now nine in a row retired by Dempster. And it's a nice contrast between the difference or one of the differences between these two teams. The Red Sox defense has been pretty good. And Drew has been very good. So he gets the first out here of the fourth inning. This is Alexei Ramirez. And the misfortune of grounding into a 6 4 3 double play in the first inning it helped out Dempster after he had walked the first two batters. That he faced in the first inning right out of the gate tonight. Ramirez rips this foul out ahead. Set it down to Jenny Dell. I am so lucky to be joined by Amy and her eight year old daughter, Brooke, here. Amy, can you tell us Brooke's story? Brooke was diagnosed um, four and a half years ago with stage four high risk neuroblastoma. Um, she went through a year and a half of treatment and she was able to uh, get to know evidence of disease. Um, but last December, she relapsed. So we're back in treatment again. So it's Jimmy Fun Month here. And I know that, Brooke, you got to meet David Ortiz. And I believe he gave you something. Can you share with our fans at home what he gave you? Um, his magic batting gloves. And what makes them magic? What did David tell you? Yet the. Wiggle your fingers and whenever you want a little magic to happen. Have they made you feel a little bit better? Yes. All right, so we raised $3.3 million, everyone calling in and supporting the Jimmy Fund and the Jimmy Fund Radio Telethon. What's your experience been like with the Jimmy Fund and Dana Farber, and why should fans at home pick up that phone and make that phone call and donate? Uh, our experience has been amazing there. We, uh, we've we moved up here from Maryland for six months for a phase one clinical trial that's only offered in two places in the world, and the Jimmy Fund is one of them. And um, the, just the doctors, the nurses, everybody there has been incredible to us. And, um, you know, we're just really desperate for a cure at this point. And I'm um, just really hoping that this is it. But we just, the research money that's coming in is just so important to us and to other families like us that, you know, there's, we just need that hope. You know, I think the cure is near, but they need the money to be able to, to find it. And I think they're close. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you, Brooke. One nothing Red Sox have the lead.
president in the next break. Just leave it. One to nothing. Red Sox have the lead over the White Sox as we play into the bottom of the fourth inning. Stephen Drew, Will Middlebrooks, and Jacoby Ellsbury. Red Sox getting a run in the third inning, and Santiago got through that third. Back out there to start the fourth. Don Cooper hoping he can go a little while longer. I'm mildly surprised to see him back out there, to be honest. I mean, I know he's allowed a lot of run on two hits, but he looked really bad. Perhaps kind of pushing it here by sending it back out again, but maybe he'll find some sort of rhythm. One two pitch. That is off the outside edge. And conversely, if you're a Red Sox fan, you've got to be encouraged by the rhythm that Dempster has settled into. Mm -hmm. He looked a little strong, which you could understand with a long layoff in the first, but he's pitched very well since then. Swing and a miss, and he's able to strike out Stephen Drew for the first out of the bottom of the fourth inning. That's his coverage of Red Sox baseball is brought to you in part by Eastern Bank. You put your family first, job first, even your team first. Isn't it time someone put you first? Eastern Bank does just that with products like Eastern Free Checking. Here, your first Eastern Bank. Well, nice night here in Boston as we play game one of the three-game series between the Red Sox and the White Sox. And Will Middlebrooks gets his second at bat of the night. Middlebrooks reaching on a fielder's choice in the second inning. And now Fegley is headed out to the mound to talk to Santiago. They'll start following Nesson on Twitter for the latest breaking news and programming alerts. It's all available on your computer and mobile device. Follow us on twitter.com slash Nesson. Right now the bullpen for the White Sox is quiet. So Fegley's conversation is relatively brief, but it's not to buy time. Now one down here in the fourth inning. And Middlebrooks climbs back in. A little pitch up and in. Outfield set up straight away here on Middlebrooks. That pitch was not close either. I mean, that's way below the knees. It's a fastball, just missed. Yeah, it does not get credit for the strike that time. You're not throwing strikes, you're not going to get that call. That's exactly what I was about to say. You're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. That is the fifth walk given up by Santiago. A comfortable feel for Robin Ventura. He looks like he's very close to exhibiting that same expression that Don Cooper had last half of it. Last in. So one out, one on. And Jacoby Ellsbury, who's 0 for 2, struck out, grounded out. Over the inside corner for strike one. The five walks allowed by Santiago tonight is a season high. And that's only through three and a third innings in tonight's game. Say he has been wild is an understatement. But the Red Sox not really been able to take advantage of the walk so far. Now they've left six so far. Red Sox had some chances last night, too, in the finale of the Orioles series. One for ten with runners in scoring position last night is a check on Middlebrooks at first base. And really, as you were watching that game last night, with the way things have been going for the Red Sox this year, you just kept waiting, assuming that that hit was going to come, whether it came in the eighth, whether it came in the ninth. It never came, but that's been the exception this year, not the norm. Yeah, they had the feeling in the eighth and ninth, it was just a matter of time before they came back to at least tie it. Middlebrooks takes off, pitch high and tight. The throw is going to get through into center field, and Middlebrooks will stop there as he quickly gets to Diaza. 
As the Red Sox have been running tonight, Shane Victorino had a stolen base in the first, and now Middlebrooks here in the fourth inning. And the throw on Victorino's steal was pretty good, but this was not a good throw. At one hop, Ramirez, the shortstop, had no chance he handcuffed, handcuffed really, trying to play it on one hop, and it went right through to center field. Not a good throw by Fegley. Middlebrooks' first stolen base of this year. His last stolen base in August of last year and now stands at second with one down. Ellsbury will hit a one hopper to short that made Ramirez back up and his throw is just going to get Ellsbury at first base. Turned out to be a very close play as Middlebrooks takes third. The ball exploded on Ramirez at short. And I think he had no choice but to back up. It almost ate him alive, but he really couldn't come in on that ball. And with the speed of Ellsbury, it was very close at first. He's got a great arm and shows it off there to get Jacoby by half a step. And the White Sox were off yesterday. Wednesday, Ramirez didn't play, didn't start. First time all year he hasn't started. Which for a guy who's used to be out, used to be out there every day, that's a little unusual. Sometimes can unnerve a guy. Two down here in the inning. Middlebrooks at third base. As Victorino takes strike one. Pop up foul off to the right, and Victorino's down 0 and 2. As we take a look at his heat zone against lefties, some terrific numbers for him on the year 371 in the second half. And you look at those hot zones, I mean, right down the middle, you would expect that, but on the outside part of the plate, low and outside, he's been doing major damage. A lot of the focus has been on right on right because it's so unusual. Here he's got the regular setup where he's seen a left handed pitcher from the right side. And then they come in 0 2, 1 and 2. And you can't help but think where would the Red Sox be without Shane Victorino? How important he has become to this team, batting here in the two hole, but his defensive play in right field. To right center and in for a base hit for Victorino. From third comes Middlebrooks, and the Red Sox take a 2 0 lead. A uh, two out RBI single for Shane Victorino. Third time he has been on base tonight. And look at where this pitch is. He does a great job of staying with it, hits it where it's pitched, just serves it. I mean, that pitch was outside. That was not a strike. But he just reaches out, flicks it right over the head of the second baseman. So Boston on top two to nothing. Victorino held on at first. They're going to throw over as Canerco holds him on. Third look tonight for Dustin Pedroia at Hector Santiago. He has walked against him and popped out to short. In there for strike one. If you're Santiago, what are you thinking? I've been throwing it all over the place. I throw a pitch that's a foot off the plate, and Victorino still whacks it for an RBI sink. Patichka still up in the bullpen. No one is driven to left. Will it stay fair down the line? It will, and it's off the wall. Victorino to third. To second goes Pedroia with a wall ball double. And the Sox have runners at second and third with two down. First hit of the night for Dustin Pedroia. And that was a good job by Pedroia just keeping the ball fair as he hooked that one. And it looked with the spin of the ball like it might not stay fair, but it did. Just on top of that CVS side, which created a funny carom in left. So two down, second and third, and big poppy David Ortiz coming up. He's been on twice tonight without the benefit of a base hit. Reached on a fielder's choice in the first and then walked in the third inning. Take strike one. And that wasn't a strike. That pitch was outside, low and outside. 
And that's where Santiago has been pitching Ortiz all night long. Way outside this time, and a nice play by Fegley. He saves a run with that pick. Now there are two down, first base is open, but Ortiz is in a slump. If you're Santiago, you've got the lefty lefty matchup that you want. You'd expect him to go right after Ortiz here. Missing away, and it's two and one. If he doesn't get him, whether he walks him or reaches by any fashion, you have to think that's it for Santiago. Torino at third, Pedroia at second, two down here in the fourth inning. Ortiz with a swing and a miss. Fastball looked faster than 91 miles an hour. He's able to get it by Big Poppy. And I think Big Poppy knows that he missed a pitch to crush. And that might be a good illustration that right now his timing is just a little bit off. That's a hittable pitch. 91, fastball in the zone. And he doesn't usually miss those pitches. Fouls it off to the left, stays alive here. And that was 94. That's about as hard as we've seen Santiago throw all night long on pitch number 99. Wow, full extension in the stands. Nice grab. Two handed. Pitch number 100 of the night for Santiago. Outside for ball three. That was 95. I think Santiago knows. Either get Ortiz here or I'm out. Ortiz is going to get it through the shift in the right center field. Victorino will score. Pedroia behind him, and the Red Sox take a 4 0 lead. Breaks up a string of 0 for 23 for Big Poppy as he drives in a pair. Santiago came back with a fastball. Again, 95. That's as hard as he can throw. But Ortiz wasn't late this time, and that'll be Santiago's last pitch. Robin Ventura out to make the change. The Red Sox get a run last inning, three this inning, and all of them coming with two outs in the inning. Well, a welcome sight as Big Poppy David Ortiz drives in two runs with his base hit, and the Red Sox take a 4 nothing lead and chase Hector Santiago from the game.
He's driving in a couple with a base hit. Red Sox have Ortiz at first and two down. Johnny Gomes gets his third plate appearance of the night. And yeah, takes a ball high for ball one from Jake Patrishka. Into the game here for the White Sox. His fourth appearance, 1 0, the 6.75 earned run average. Walk in a strikeout. Opponent sitting at 400 against Patrishka. He's been here since the 18th of August. Called up from AAA Charlotte by the White Sox. He's recorded a total of four outs in his major league career. Had been 5 and 0 with a 1.81 earned run average. In 31 appearances between AAA Charlotte and AA Birmingham. And there for a strike to Gomes, and it's 2 and 1. Santiago responsible for Ortiz at first and so far charged with four runs. Two and two. Healthy hack that time by Gomes. And he was loading up on that one. That was a slider. Late swing and look out. Mike Napoli's got a little dance over there to get out of the way. That was a slider as well. Almost a perfect pitch, really. All Gomes could do just to stay alive. Look out, Mike Napoli. Two two. On the ground to third base, Kepinger will go to second for the force out that ends the inning, but the damage done. Boston scores three times, and they take a 4-0 lead at the end of four. The top half of the fifth inning. Well, for every Red Sox game that goes into extra innings, where the Sox get a save, CBS Pharmacy will get a donation to Boston Children's Hospital towards their $25,000 donation this season. And we head to the top half of the fifth. This is a quick liner by Middlebrooks at third base. Paul Canerco, hot shot down into the corner. Gomes will go dig it out. Canerco is thinking too, and he'll get there without a problem. Is Gomes had trouble getting it. Pulled around down there in the left field corner. It actually came out of the corner and by him at one point. And that is the first hit of the night for the White Sox. And it comes to lead off the fifth inning just out of the reach of Middlebrooks. 
He came very close to grabbing it. It was actually underneath his glove as he dove to his right. And Canerco with the double here to start the inning has really been an offensive disappointment. If you looked at the White Sox in their lineup and tried to identify areas that where guys have underperformed, he might be at the top of the list. And Canerco coming in hitting at 245, nine home runs. Abasiel Garcia, who struck out in the second inning. That's his second look at Dempster. All right, Dempster has a string of 11 in a row retired snapped here in the fifth inning by Canerco to get it started. A little foul off to the right. And Dempster and Santiago had similar starts, at least in terms of pitches needed to get through their first inning of work. But now look at Dempster sitting about to throw his 60th pitch. Did have a long wait while the Red Sox were scoring. This is quickly by the dive of Drew and into left field. Canerco heads to third. And a base hit by Garcia. And all of a sudden it's first and third for the White Sox with nobody out. Garcia seems like a nice young player. And that's one thing about the White Sox. They didn't fool anybody. They knew exactly what they were coming into the trade deadline. And they were sellers. Sometimes you look at the teams that don't do that, that obviously are not contenders, yet still are reluctant to sell. And you think, well, what are they playing for? What are they, what are they holding on to these assets for? But the White Sox didn't do that. They, they realize where they are. Garcia was the up-and-coming player, as you mentioned, one of their top prospects in the Tigers organization. Ends up with the White Sox and appears to have a pretty bright future in Chicago. And appeared everybody kind of won in that three-team deal. Lacey has been very good defensively for the Tigers, and Red Sox have enjoyed Jake Peavy's work so far here with Boston. We'll get to see Peavy tomorrow night against his old team. Of course, Matt Thornton, part of this team as well, working out of the bullpen for the Red Sox, worked in last night's game. Keppinger will take the strike, and it's one and one. Runner goes at first. Here's the chopper left side. And coming home with it is Middlebrooks. Single Canerco hung up. Saltanamaki will tag him out. They get the lead runners. It works out. Canerco does not run well at all. And Middlebrooks took a look and said, we can get this guy and comes home with it. Canerco is not fast. He had plenty of time, too. I mean, Middlebrooks was ready to throw the first, stopped, and he was still out by a mile. So Kepinger reaches on a fielder's choice, and the White Sox have runners at first and second. Red Sox able to cut down the lead runner between third and home to retire Canerco for the first out of the inning. And going to bring up Diane Viseyedo. And I think normally if you're a third baseman in that situation, you don't even think about it. You're up 4 nothing. It's the fifth inning. You take the out at first. You take the out at second, depending on the situation. But well, that was an obvious play. It wasn't going to be a double play because they had Garcia starting at first base as he was in motion. Luciano getting his second at bat of the night, grounded out to third base, first time up. That's great to have John Risch with us tonight. And John began the season this year on WEI, but now. Another endeavor for you. It is. Yeah, it's a little different. I'm used to being in the booth to my right, but I did. I went back to school, learned a lot in 10 weeks, and started a new position just uh, about two weeks ago. In there for strike, and it's one and one. I'm a uh, web developer now, Doc. So if this gig does not work out for me, how long is this program? I mean, is this... Well, a... Don, it is very selective. <laughs> so you're saying I can't do it. I didn't say no. I mean, I don't make those decisions. I'm just saying... I, I saw what you do. Don't give up I'm the day job. I'm telling you what, I am not doing that. That is hard. 
I, you, I mean, you showed me one thing that you said was simple. Very simple. It was like a very basic entry level thing. And I don't have a lot of skill. I'm waiting for Joe to call me to ask me to come fix his computer. That hasn't <laughs> happened yet. It will. It will. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I started a new position almost two weeks ago. Barbershop Labs, great spot. Great boss. Let me have the day off to come work with you, Adam Rubin. Huge Red Sox fan. The one-two pitch is up high, and it's two and two. I don't have a lot of skills. I'm not even really that good at this. So you, if... You, <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking if, if about? This doesn't work out. I'm in real trouble. How long trouble. have you been here now? This is my 13th season. It's gone by very quickly. I watch you work that iPhone over there. <laughs> <laughs> Garcia at second, Kepinger at first. And the 2 2 is up the middle and into center field. From second, Garcia is going to score the first run of the night for the White Sox. And Diane Viciato drives it in on a bounding ball back up the middle into center field. And splitting both Drew and Pedroia back of the bag at second. The, the Canerco hit was a, was a scalding shot. That was blasted past the diving Middlebrooks. But other than that, it's been some ground balls here. Dempster's been throwing strikes. I'm sure when he looks at it, though, he's just disappointed. My team just put three on the board. He wanted to come back with a shutdown inning. And the first hits that Dempster has allowed in this game have all come in this fifth inning. Technologically speaking, Don, I don't, I don't think you should sell yourself so short. I look forward to um, your tweets. <laughs> I didn't know you followed me. On oh, Twitter. sure, yeah. Uh, welcome aboard. <laughs> I know I, every off day I can count on some food. Yeah. You yeah, make something, there's always a picture of food. That's true. That's right up my alley. That's true. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, I oh, love wow. to eat. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a struggle trying to figure out because I'm just not that interested. And then you're supposed to come up with like one thing a day. At least. And there's a fly ball out to right center field and hit well. Ellsbury will track it down. Tagging at second base is Kepinger. He's going to move to third, but Ellsbury, a good running catch out there in right center. He makes it look easy out there. A long way to go. He does make it look easy. Where he started, where he ended up, makes the grab shy of the track. You can see him calling for it all the way in perfect stride. He had that one timed. So what was your one thing today? I missed it. I haven't done one yet today. <laughs> you didn't miss it. It didn't happen. <laughs> there you go. Still got time, though. I have three hours before today is over. First and third, two down. Diaz at the battery. Walked in the first, lined out to second. In the third inning and take strike one. Time call very late and Dempster follows through with the pitch. The umpire Dana Demuth granting the timeout to Diazza. And that would have been a good pitch, too. Dempster's thinking, I put it exactly where I wanted. It doesn't count. That was very, very late. You wonder sometimes why the umpire allows that. Moves the ground ball left side. Drew charging. Throw on the run and in time. Able to get Diazza to end the inning. The White Sox get on the board. They get a run in the top of the fifth. It's 4 1 Boston.
Back at Fenway and ready to go in the bottom of the fifth inning as Mike Napoli, Jared Saltalamaki, and Stephen Drew will be coming up here in the bottom of the fifth. Patricia back on the mound here for the White Sox into the second inning of relief. Napoli has struck out and walked as he takes a slider outside for ball one. Trishka may be going a while here for Chicago. We'll see. Santiago, the starter, only able to go three and two thirds into tonight's game. And Patricia had pretty good numbers in the minors. He was a swing and miss guy. He had some good strikeout numbers, but he worked primarily as a reliever. So sometimes you see a young pitcher, maybe they started in their minor league career working out of the pen. Not the case in his in this instance. Napoli hits it on the ground to Gordon Beckham at second base for the first out of the fifth inning. Well, Hess and Hess Express are proud sponsors of the Red Sox, and during the season, they'll donate $500 to the Red Sox Foundation. For every home run hit by the Sox to date, 69500 has been donated. Hess and Hess Express committed to helping the cause. One down in the fifth, and Jared Saltalamacchia coming up. He is 0 for 2. Flyed out to center, popped out to third. He came up with the bases loaded his last time up. That's so kind of letting Hector Santiago off the hook a bit in that third inning. They made him pay in the fourth, scoring three more times. Trish got his first major league win on the 22nd of August at Kansas City. And gets that one by Salta at 94 miles an hour. And it's been a contrast from Santiago. He's been working pretty fast. He's been in the zone. Swing, protective swing by Salta Lamaki as he fouls it off. Let's check in on our AT&T poll tonight. And it appears that Frozen Fenway is running away with it tonight at the moment. I think the really answer that I'd have to know who the band or artist was for the concert. Swing and a miss and a pitch down and in to Jared Salta Lamaki. Slider's been working for Patrushkin. He picks up his first strikeout, two down. Now, which band is it, Don, that you've been trying to line up all summer and it hasn't worked for the schedule? Dave Matthews band. That's right. So if it was Dave Matthews, it's an oh, obvious wow. choice. That for changes you. everything. Meek Insurance, proud sponsor of the Amika Pitch Zone. Slider that time from Patrushka. Yeah, they played something like 65 dates this summer, and I've been in something like 18 to 20 cities this summer, and I'm not going to see any of them. None of them. And none of them match up. So it's not happening. First summer in a while. It's very sad. Do they only tour in the summer? Uh, no, it's possible they do okay. do some winners, but right now they're in the midst of their summer tour. Drew follows it off to the left out of play. Another one of those nuggets you can glean from Twitter. It's unbelievable what you've gotten from my Twitter. <laughs> I follow you, though, I think, too, right? I don't know. You don't seem to know much. No, I'm pretty well. <laughs> well, I knew you were computer programming. <laughs> I know you're John Risch. That's the basics. You did Boston College hockey. Yep. Fly ball to right field. Garcia moves in a step or two and makes the catch. It ends the inning. A 1 2 3 fifth and a 4 1 Red Sox lead.
to right center and in for a base hit for Victorino. From third comes Middlebrooks and the Red Sox take a 2 nothing lead. Ortiz is going to get it through to shift in the right center field. Victorino will score. Pedroia behind him and the Red Sox take a 4 nothing lead. So far, so good for the Red Sox as we head into the sixth inning. And a grounder softly foul off the bat of Gordon Beckham who leads it off here in the sixth inning. Oh, nice return so far for Ryan Dempster. Ran into his first trouble in the fifth inning. And a string of uh, 11 in a row that he had retired. Didn't give up. A base hit until the fifth inning. He walked the first two batters he faced. But he works his way around three hits and gives up a run. In the fifth, Beckham goes after that and is down 0 and 2. The Yankees tonight have a 7 to 5 lead over the Baltimore Orioles. They're in the sixth inning. Baltimore going to New York after dropping two out of three to the Red Sox. On the outside corner, and Beckham strikes out. That was a very good pitch. Strike two was one that Beckham would want back. That was inside. But this strike three pitch was paint on the corner. And this froze Beckham. Ended up being an 89 mile an hour fastball as he strikes out. Last whiff brought to you by Head and Shoulders. He's had a frustrating night, including that play at second where he missed the tag. Alexei Ramirez 0 for 2 in the game. He grounded into a 6 4 3 double play in the first inning, grounded out the second in the fourth inning. Shortstop. It was rising, but Drew goes up to get it for the second out of the inning. He timed it well. He never left his feet, but you're right. It was still rising when it got to the essentially the top of his head where he grabbed it. And two down here in the inning now. Four in a row retired by Dempster, and it brings up Adam Dunn. One of the few guys who've seen the Red Sox go on a shift on here from the White Sox is Adam Dunn. Truly a pole hitter. And into short right field goes Dustin Pedroia. One oh is tap foul and it's one and one. Now Dunn has struck out twice tonight, but he is one of the guys in this White Sox lineup that has good career numbers against Dempster. A couple of home runs, a lot of walks. Uh, it's hit 300, OPS of over 1,300 against him, career coming in. Down and into Dunn, and it's two and one. And Dempster in his career does not have good numbers against the White Sox. ERA over five. Now all of that came when he was pitching in a Cubs uniform. Natural rival, of course, in interleague. Two one is high, and it's three and one. Well, at least ticket brings you the pitching line for Ryan Dempster. Five and two thirds, three hits, one run coming last inning. Two walks to the first two batters he faced tonight. And five strikeouts, including one this inning. Dunn will lay off and take ball four as he heads down to first base. You mentioned earlier, he's a guy who does walk quite a bit. He does three true outcomes walk, strikeout, home run. So he's got two K's and a walk. You just hope the home run's not coming for the Red Sox sake. Well, Advil is the official pain reliever of the Boston Red Sox and proud supporter of volunteers. Go to Advil.com to find out about the Advil Relief in Action campaign. So two down here in the sixth inning. Adam Dunn at first base. And Paul Canerco coming up. Canerco flied out to center field in the second inning, doubled in the fifth. As one of the three White Sox hits on the night. 
And the first hit of the night for Chicago. And probably the best hit ball that the White Sox have gotten off of Dempster tonight. But you look at, and you mentioned his numbers before. You see Paul Canerco slugging 357. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Tried to hold up. Did he go? Yes, he did. Says first base umpire Paul Nauer. We'll get the side view. That's close. Could have gone either way. Well, used to seeing the home runs in the mid to upper 20s. Guy who had uh, over 40 home runs on two occasions. Canerco pops it up. Pedroia will take charge right in behind second puts it away. We're five and a half deep. Red Sox have a 4-1 lead. Sports today presented by People's United Bank. Adam Pellerin and Gary Streisky quarterback our coverage of the Patriots' latest roster cuts and also preview the fall sports season about to get underway here in Boston. All that and a recap of tonight's baseball game and more coming your way after our Sox coverage on Nesson Sports Today. Well, David Percy into the game here for the White Sox. Their third pitcher of the night into his 17th game of the year. One and one with a 2.03 earned run average. He has walked more than he has struck out. 13 free passes to 12 Ks. And Will Middlebrooks leads it off and takes a pitch in the dirt for ball one. Jake Patrishka did a pretty good job. He retired all four batters he faced in the one, two, three, fifth inning. In relief of the pitcher of record on the losing side right now, Hector Santiago. Lasted just three and two thirds. Brooks has been on twice tonight without the benefit of a base hit. Reached on a fielder's choice in the second. Walked and scored in the fourth inning. And goes around for strike two. Now it's a slider. You might remember Percy from his time with Toronto. He pitched for a while for the Blue Jays. He's mostly fastball slider. 93 in the fastball. Here you see the slider. That's in the 83, 84 mile per hour range. Eleven of his 12 appearances have been scoreless, giving him one earned run and 10 in a third inning, despite all the walks. 
One two pitch is going to miss and it evens at two and two. Did not pitch at all in the majors last year. 47 games in Lehigh Valley last year at the triple A level. Middlebrooks lines this into center field. They sit to begin things in the bottom of the sixth inning. Red Sox get their sixth hit of the game. First for Middlebrooks. Well, download Duncan's new mobile app with it. You can load a Dunkin' Donuts card and pay right from your phone. You also can receive exclusive mobile offers and send Dunkin' gift cards. Message and data rates may apply. For full terms of use, visit www.dunkindonuts.com slash mobile terms. Lead runner on for the Red Sox in the sixth inning, and it brings up Jacoby Ellsbury. Ellsbury 0 for 3 in the top spot in the Red Sox order and trying to bunt and fouls it off up into the air and into the crowd. And that was a tough pitch to bunt. That pitch was up. Not easy to get something like that down. I wasn't sure where it was. It was a little in. It was almost as if after he squared, he had started to maybe think, uh oh. And then it just fouled it off. Toss to first and Middlebrooks back to the bag at first, held on by Canerco. Move the center fielder Alejandro Diaz into left center for Ellsbury to go the other way. Swing and a miss and a pitch down and it's 0 2. So Diaz over towards the left center and well off the line in right is Garcia. Low and away, one and two. Swing and a miss. It gets away. Figley, the catcher's got to get it. He's going to have no play. Ellsbury cannot take first base as he was occupied at the time. So he strikes out and taking second is Middlebrooks at his own risk. And Ellsbury helped him out there. They ruled out a wild pitch, allowing Middlebrooks to take the bag. But that ball was in the dirt. That's kind of a tough at bat for Els. It wasn't comfortable. No. Right from the get go with the attempt at the bunt that was up and in. And you can see he's visibly frustrated after swinging at that one. It's always a tough run when you have struck out and then try to reach at first base. Not the same zest as you take off, you know. One down as Middlebrooks takes second on the wild pitch. Victorino standing in. And Shane will take strike one. Then another good night on base three times in the game. Walk stole a base in the first, singled and scored in the third, singled and scored in the fourth inning. A little grounder foul outside of third. Now you think back to that RBI single that he had. That. Gives you an idea of how things have been going for Victorino as of late. He's so hot. It really seems like no matter where the ball is, he's just going to hit it for a base hit. That pitch was way outside. He just served it. Out over the head of Beckham, the second baseman. 22 RBIs in the month of August. Tied for third in the American League in that category. 
And trying to deliver Will Middlebrooks here with one out in the sixth inning. And a grounder left side. Alexei Ramirez plays the high hop. And the throw gets Victorino for the second out of the inning. No advance for Middlebrooks. It's time now for a Toyota game break. Here's Tom Karen. All right, Tom, thanks very much. They're going to put Dustin Pedroia on with the first base open. The intentional walk coming here from David Percy to Dustin Pedroia. And this is the left right thing. That Ortiz, of course, waiting on deck. Hasn't happened a lot where the team has intentionally walked the three hitter to get to David Ortiz. So down the first base goes Pedroia, the free pass. Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, the official hospital of the Boston Red Sox, invites you to join the walking club. Sign up today, get a cool wristband, plus everything you need to start a walking program for better health. Find out more at BIDMC.org. Two on, two down, and David Ortiz looking to do some damage here after Pedroia's walk to get to him. There's ball one. And the left right thing makes sense when you look at Percy's career numbers. In his career, his OPS against is. Well, about 150 points lower against left-handed batters than it is against righties. And David fouling this back one and one. There was a time, though, that this would never happen. And even with Ortiz in a slump that he broke out of with his last two RBI hit, rarely, I can't think of hardly any situation where anyone would ever put somebody on to get to Poppy. Unfamiliar territory as he waits on a 1 1 pitch. And he'll take it outside for ball two. Ortiz against lefties this season, hitting at 258. Crushing right handed pitching at 341. Does have five home runs off left handed pitching on the season. Ortiz fouls it back and it's two and two. Three full count, and the runners can get a start now. Two down in the inning. Little Brooks at second, Pedroia at first. Two outs here in the sixth. Everything's been middle away so far. Nothing inside the Ortiz. And David will take the walk to load the bases. That is now the seventh walk given up by White Sox pitching in this game. I don't think that's the strategy that Robin Ventura had in mind. 
Potentially walking Pedroia to walk Ortiz. Probably not. To load the bases. <laughs> to face a right-handed bat. <laughs> well, Johnny Gomes gets his fourth plate appearance of the night. Popped out to short in the first. Hit by a pitch in the third and then grounded into a fielder's choice in the fourth inning. Chance to do some damage here and open this up. Red Sox have a three-run advantage at the moment. Uh, but it does illustrate the point. Intentional walks. Most times, really? Is it necessary? I mean, you just created the situation. Maybe you should have gone after Pedroia. Outside for ball one. And now Don Cooper is coming out here after this first pitch delivered to Napoli, who's up and away. Well, the Ford Summer Spectacular is here, and it feels so good to get a blockbuster deal on a new Ford car, crossover, SUV, or truck at your New England Ford dealers. And David Percy gave up a leadoff single to Middlebrook, struck out Ellsbury, got Victorino to ground out, the intentional walk of Pedroia, and then the walk of David Ortiz has the bases loaded with two outs. And now he's falling behind Gomes, 1-0. So that's what 15 walks now for Percy. Yes because he came in with 13. 13. Yeah. To 13 K's. And then for a strike one and one. Ball two, two and one. Dylan Axelrod up in the pen now for the White Sox. And the starter Hector Santiago hung around for just three and two thirds innings tonight, giving up the four runs the Red Sox have to this point. All the runs earned runs. Gomes pops it up foul. That'll get back it out of play and even the count of two and two. And Clay Buckholz after his rehab start comes here. Why not? It's a popular spot, Fenway Park. Now back it off is Percy again. A count of two and two here to Johnny Gomes. One more start for Clay, and then he could be back. Gomes lays off and a full count three and two. Everybody will be on the move here. The base is loaded and two down. See the numbers for Clay Buckholz tonight. Total of 53 pitches for Buckholz. Base is loaded two down and Johnny Gomes winning on a three two pitch. Fouls it back below us. That was a pretty good pitch to hit. Inside fastball right above the belt. Middlebrooks at third, Pedroy at second, Ortiz at first. Holmes fouls it off and that clanks right off of Fegley, the catcher for the White Sox. So 
some of the gloves, some of the mask. Bases filled with Red Sox, two down here in the sixth inning. Pretty good at bat turned in here by Johnny Gomes. And he strikes out as Percy gets out of the jam. This continues to be a three run lead for the Red Sox. across the Northeast. Visit fwweb.com for more info about this proud sponsor of the Boston Red Sox. That's fwweb. Top of the seventh inning. 4-1 Red Sox on top and a foul fly back and out of play off the bat of Garcia. And there's Ryan Dempster back out on the mound here for the seventh inning. That was his 87th pitch of his outing. And has pitched very well here tonight against the White Sox. Just a one run coming in the fifth. Garcia thought about it. Did he go? No. Says Paul Nauert, first base umpire. The pitch was, should have been a called strike. That was right there at the knees. One one pitch. A little fly ball struck well out to deep right center field. Ellsbury going back, and that's into the bullpen and gone. Have a CL Garcia gets his fourth home run of the season, his second in a White Sox uniform, and it's now four to two. His second hit of the night. And he looks like a pretty good young player. Not easy to poke one out the spot he did. That was a slider, and it just hung. I and mean, that was way up there. Not the location Dempster's looking for with a breaking ball. <laughs> Look at that reaction from Janichi Tozawa, who's warming up in the pen. Well, Jeff Kepinger takes strike one. Kepinger 0 for 2 in the game. He's grounded out to short, reached on a fielder's choice. Four runs, six hits, no errors for Boston. Now two runs, four hits, no errors for the White Sox. White Sox have left the bases loaded twice in this game. That doesn't come back to haunt them in this one. Bases left loaded in the third. Bases left loaded in the sixth inning. And the Red Sox have left ten men on through the first six innings. 
Dempster is 2 1. That's always a glasses half full proposition, right? The left on base, because teams that don't score a lot of runs don't leave a lot of guys on base because they don't get guys on base. So you see high numbers in that category. It's not necessarily a bad thing overall. But on a game by game basis, it can be pretty frustrating. Especially when it comes down to wins and losses. And you mentioned it was that story last night. Ten men left on base against the Orioles. Payoff pitch here to Kepinger. And a grounder by the mound. Drew picks and throws for the first out of the inning. Send it down to Jenny. Well, Don, there are so many great events here to be had when there isn't baseball to be played at Fenway Park. So we want to remind our fans at home to vote in our AT&T text poll question of the night. We're asking them what they enjoy the most. And right now it looks like Frozen Fenway is running away with it. Just keep on voting 536-536. Message and data rates may apply. We're going to keep this going through the game, through the post game, And the final results will be in Nesson Sports today, Don. All right, Jay, thanks very much. Diane Viciedo jumps on the first pitch and fouls it off to the right out of play. Have you seen a concert here at Fenway Park? I have not. Well, because we were always working Away, right. and on the road when the concerts were here. Yes. Um, my wife and my mother-in-law did come to see Neil Diamond here. Uh -huh. They loved it. We went to the sound check uh, for Bruce Springsteen some years ago, but that was it. We had to leave to go to the game. That would be pretty Is cool. It? I would yeah. like to see Bruce here. VC Edo is one for two with an RBI single as he takes a healthy hack for strike two. All in all, though, I think you've got to be very encouraged with the performance of Dempster tonight. He's closing in on 100 pitches. Well, here he is working in the seventh inning after the long layoff, some struggles over the course of the month of August. He's pitched pretty well. He's not had a victory in the month of August. This one is struck well to left field and it's going to grab some wall. Ricochet played quickly by Gomes and he'll fire back in. Nicely done. Old Viciedo to a long single. He's been doing that a lot lately out in left. So it's a feel for playing that wall. And that's going to do it for Dempster. After this wall ball single. You're right, he has pitched well and John Feld does not want to push his luck tonight. As he heads out to make the change, Dempster coming off. He'll leave with a 4 2 lead.
Tom Karen and Tim Wakefield to break down the game. And Jenny will bring you Clubhouse Reaction. WB Mason, extra innings live. Can't go wrong when you buy right. WB Mason. Well, John Farrell making the change. Ryan Dempster done after his six and a third inning. Still responsible for Viciedo, who is at first base. And he makes the change as this call to the bullpen is brought to you on Nesson by New England Ford dealers. Jaichi Tozawa now in. And for Tozawa, his 60th appearance of the year, 5 and 3 with a 2.75 earned run average. 63 strikeouts to only 9 walks, and opponent sitting at 262 against Tozawa. Charged with a run and a third of an inning on Saturday, last pitched in Los Angeles against the Dodgers. Bagley hits a fly ball to left field. Gomes moves over and makes the catch. Back to first goes Viciedo. One pitch and one out here for Tozawa. Two down in the inning. You mentioned the strikeout numbers, Don. Those are obscene when you think about it. I mean, if you look at it as a rate stat, he's striking out about 26% of the batters he's facing. Against those walks for a relief pitcher, that's extremely valuable. His numbers, as well as Koji Uihara's numbers, and the strikeout to walk ratios are amazing. Where would the Red Sox be without that combination? With all the injuries that have taken place in the pen. Anderhan Bailey Miller lost for the year. Alejandro Diaz of the batter, and he lines this down the right field line. It is going to be a fair ball. Rattles around to the right field corner. Trying to score from first is Viciedo. He will and headed to third base with a triple goes Diaza. And this is a one run game. It's now four to three. I don't think Victorino could have played this one any different along the wall. He had to wait for it to rattle around, but it one hopped off the side wall. He had no choice but just to wait for it to get to him. He, he couldn't get a different angle to cut it off sooner. And Diaz can fly. So now the tying run 90 feet away. We were just talking about all the chances the Red Sox have had tonight, leaving the bases loaded twice in this game. And that includes in the bottom of the sixth inning. Now the White Sox right back in it again, trailing by a run. And here's Gordon Beckham. The two outs in the inning. In the dirt for ball one. Beckham walked back in the first inning. Since then, he's lined out to short and struck out looking. Ball by him at 95 miles an hour. A little extra there from Tazal, one and one. When Beckham was late. Beckham, who initially came up as a third baseman with the White Sox. the outside edge to Zal wanted it and it's two and one that has moved around a little bit I think he was a shortstop for the bulk of his minor league career mm -hmm. spent time at third he doesn't have the offense to justify a third base position the second base maybe but to play third you've got to be a little more pop than Beckham gives him and 16 home runs last year this year only four on the season Swings at the 2 1, and it's a high fly ball to center field. Ellsbury tracking it as he moves back and makes the catch that ends the inning. White Sox get a pair of runs. It's a one run game in seventh inning stretch from Fenway.
should be a fabulous fall for the New England sports fans. It's Nesson Sports Today, presented by People's United Bank tonight after our Red Sox coverage. Let's on to the home half of the seventh inning. Red Sox now have a one run lead. And a 4 0 lead at one point in this game. Mike Napoli leading it off here in the last of the seventh inning. Jared Saltalamacchio, then Stephen Drew. Napoli struck out in the second, walked in the third, grounded out in the fifth inning. David Percy back on the mound. He pitched the sixth inning back out there for the seventh. Third arm used by Robin Venturi in the game. Two and oh. Well, these aerial views are brought to you by Hood, the official dairy of the Boston Red Sox. Follow the Hood Blimp on Facebook and Twitter at Hood Blimp. For ball three, three and zero. Oh. Saw Percy's numbers had trouble with walks and walk two in the sixth inning. One was intentional, but falls behind Napoli here, three and zero. Oh. I think he was fortunate to get out of that jam with Gomes. Axelrod, the right-hander, still warming. There's a strike, three and one. Yankees have an 8 5 lead tonight against the Baltimore Orioles as they move to the eighth at Yankee Stadium. And again, Tampa Bay starts tonight two and a half games back of the Red Sox on the West Coast tonight, taking on the Oakland A's. High fly ball. The center field playable for Alejandro Diaz. He makes the catch a little backpedal in the end. Red Sox end of the summer family packs are available now and include free parking courtesy of the shops at the Prudential Center as well as free Boston duck boat rides to Fenway. Visit RedSox.com slash family packs for more information. One out for Jared Saltalamaki who's 0 for 3 in the game. Fly to center pop to third and struck out swinging. Red Sox trying to take advantage of a White Sox team that is 20 games under 500, but come into Boston relatively hot, winning 10 of their last 12 games. And some of those wins have been against some pretty good teams. They played Texas over that stretch, they played Kansas City over that stretch. Now they did just come off a series against Houston, but it's not as if they've been beating up on bad teams. This is their American League East road trip after they finish here they'll go to New York and then four in Baltimore. Saltalamachia lines out to Keppinger at third base for the second out of the seventh inning. So a hot shot there but retired for the second out. So we take a look at the game summary brought to you by Xfinity from Comcast. A picture of record on the losing side at the moment for the White Sox. Hector Santiago, three and two-thirds innings, five hits, giving up the four runs the Red Sox have. On the other side, Dempster goes six and a third. And Dempster is charged with the three runs the White Sox have. Shane Victorino continues his hot pace. Two outs in the inning for Stephen Drew. And a foul down by the shoe tops for strike one. Red Sox have action in their pen. Franklin Morales had a hard time getting work lately because the Red Sox starters have been going deep into games. That's good, but there have been times when relievers have gone a while without working, and Morales, one of those guys. Last time he worked, uh, the Red Sox were in San Francisco. Been a little while. Yeah, the 20th of August. 
So 10 days ago. Curious to see too how the roster will take shape in two more days when the rosters expand. Well, last I heard the Red Sox were thinking of maybe eight nine additions maybe not all at once. How far did swing there from Drew yeah it seems like a lot doesn't it, it? does. But John Farrell said the other day I was thinking wow that, that's quite a bit. I'm not a fan of the expanded roster to be honest with you. You play into one set of rules for five months and then all of a sudden it's out the window for the last month of the year. I like the idea that you have to set your roster before every game. But even then, there has to be additional rules in that because if you're going to set a roster, let's say a 25 before every game, well, then you're just going to take the starting pitchers who just pitched that aren't going to pitch in that game, and you're still going to manipulate it that way. So you, ha you have to really set some rules in place to set the roster and then make starting pitchers ineligible to be removed from that roster on a daily basis. That's how I would do it. 2-2 Two -two is fouled back. I heard uh, Buck Showalter's thought on that the other day. He was talking about by series, which makes it kind of interesting. More strategy involved, certainly, if you've yeah. got to decide three, four days ahead of time who's right. going to be eligible for the series. I don't mind. I would be okay with day by day as long as you couldn't game the system by moving your starting pitchers on and off the roster. It'd be like a hockey team. You, know, right. you carry 21 guys and you have three healthy scratches. Drew lifts a fly ball out to center field. Diazza camps underneath and yeah, puts it away. David Percy has a one, two, three, seventh inning. We played seven. It's four, three Red Sox. Four to three. Red Sox have the lead over the White Sox, and Chinichi Tozawa back to the mound again. As Alexei Ramirez leads it off here for the White Sox, and it takes pitch outside for ball one. We've seen a lot of this lately for Tozawa going beyond one inning. Came in for the seventh, right back out there for the eighth. Red Sox do have action in the inning in the bullpen as the inning begins. One oh popped up foul and out of play one and one. Does has thrown more than an inning ten times this season. And when he does throw more than an inning he's two and oh with a one point oh six earned run average. He's only given up two earned runs in 17 innings pitched. Makes it easier too when you only need to throw six pitches to get two outs. Yeah. 
is highly economical. This one is kind of squibbed. A lot of English on it back towards the mound and Tozawa flips to first base. All kinds of spin on that baseball off the end of the bat, but Ramirez retired one to three. The Safeco Insurance says, says take a look at the road ahead. Tomorrow's Red Sox starter and former White Sox pitcher Jake Peavy. Peavy was with the White Sox from 2009 till earlier this season, compiling 36 wins in 84 games at a 4.00 earned run average during his stint in Chicago. And this season was 8-4 and four in 13 starts before being acquired by the Red Sox. Well, Tazawa has been lifted from this game the pitching change with one out in the eighth with the Red Sox on top four to three and Morales on his way in. W.B. Mason has a clutch lineup of janitorial products that will mop up the worst of your cleaning problems. And W.B. Mason delivers same day, so your worst messes will be yesterday's news. Well, Franco Morales checks into his 10th game of the year, 2 and 1, with a 6.46 earned run average, 13 Ks to 11 walks. And opponent sitting at 283 against Morales. Again, he has not worked since the 20th of August, 10 days ago in San Francisco. Now to hit and a walk, hit a batter in two thirds of an inning. That was the game in which Brian Villarreal was brought into and walked to batter with the bases loaded. One score that was charged to Morales in that outing in the literal walk off win for the San Francisco Giants against the Red Sox at AT&T Park. Now he comes in with one out to face Adam Dunn. Red Sox into the shift on the right side of the infield as Dunn takes strike one. If you're wondering why you're seeing Morales against Dunn, well, he's 0 for 6 against in lifetime with three strikeouts. And the grounder, Napoli, is going to need help at first. Morales is there, and he puts the foot in the bag for out number two. Too slowly hit for the shift to be a factor on the right side with Pedroia in short right field. So it's Napoli who's got to cover. And Napoli flips to Morales for the out. And it's going to be one and done. John Farrell headed out to make another pitching change. One and done for Dunn. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that is outstanding. <laughs> As Morales gets his job done, he gets Adam done. Two outs in the inning. The pitching change from Fenway again. Uihara is coming into this game. A little early, 4-3.
Celebrates 11 years with new low yearly prices. Watch out of market games live on over 350 supported mobile and connected devices in HD quality with MLB.TV Premium. Visit MLB.TV today. MLB.TV Baseball everywhere. Well, only one save this year for Weehar that has been more than an inning. An inning and a third against the Dodgers recently, August the 24th in L.A. And tonight, John Farrell's looking for four outs from his closer, who makes his 60th appearance of the year. 3 0, the 1.22 earned run average. Paul Canerco takes strike one from Uihara. And it's 0-2, that good splitter from Uihara. It's there, and then it's not. That's good stuff. You don't get that everywhere. Two for three in his career. He's had success in a small sample against Uihara. In the air to shallow left, and in comes Johnny Gomes. Uihara takes care of business quickly. Four, three socks as we head to the bottom of the eighth. Subaru of New England, Sullivan Tire and Auto Centers, and by Infinity. And we head to the last half of the eighth inning back at Fenway Park, 4 3. Red Sox have the lead, and Matt Lindstrom is into the game here for the White Sox, the fourth pitcher used of the night for Chicago. Two and three in the 66th game of the year, 39 Ks to 23 walks, and opponents hitting at 265 against the right hander. Middlebrooks leads it off and hits one to right field, but Garcia has it lined up and makes the catch for the first out here in the bottom of the eighth. So one down and Jacoby Ellsbury coming up. David Percy ends up going two innings for Chicago. Gives up one hit. Allowed no runs, uh, two walks, one was intentional, and struck out two batters. This is off the pitcher and kicks out to Ramirez. That was ticketed for center field, and because Lindstrom got a glove on it to get a piece, redirected it. And Ellsbury is retired. Now Jacoby is 0 for 5 in the game. And very fortunate there. Lindstrom to get a glove on it because it gave him the chance to get an out. That was a good swing, too, by Ellsbury. He squared that ball up. 
It was not flush, just reaching back across his body. Almost a perfect deflection, really was a perfect deflection to Ramirez. Sixty six appearances for Lindstrom. That is the most in the American League. He's been pretty good for Chicago. Throws hard. Bounced around. Came up with the Marlins. And two down here in the eighth. Shane Victorino. He's had a two hit night. It's also a bit on with a walk. You'd think this would be one of the tougher righty righty matchups for Victorino. Ninety four miles an hour in that fastball. Strike two. Victorino thought it was high. A quick look back at home plate umpire Dana Demuth. Cavidian delivering innovative health care products across the globe. Is a proud sponsor of the Red Sox Foundation. Victorino thought about it. Lays off a pitch outside. Two and two. Red Sox will have Avisail Garcia, Jeff Kepinger, and Diane Viciedo scheduled to bat at the top of the ninth inning. At the very least dealing with a one run deficit. Only took just a couple of pitches for Uihar to get the first of the four outs he needs to pick up a save tonight. Victorino lifts it to left field. Incoming is Viciedo. And that's a 1 2 3 8 inning for Lindstrom. We head to the ninth 4 3 Red Sox on top. Supporting the Dimmick Center in Roxbury. We thank friends such as H.B. Hood who help make the Dimmick Center a beneficiary of the Red Sox Foundation. Now it's on to the top half of the ninth inning, 4 to 3. Red Sox have the lead over the White Sox. Koji Uihara, on the benefit of three pitches, got the final out of the eighth and back out there for the ninth. W. Sale Garcia to lead it off for the White Sox. As he takes strike one. Garcia's already homered in this game. His last at bat off Ryan Dempster in the seventh inning. Two hit night. He also has single.
Yankees Orioles game has gone final Yankees beat the Orioles eight to five. Fouled off to the right and Dewey Hara is ahead one and two. So with that victory the Yankees are now only a half game behind the Orioles in the standings. It's a tough loss for the Orioles. Tampa Bay and Oakland are scoreless in the first inning underway at Ojotko Coliseum in Oakland. Swing and a miss and Uihara strikes out Garcia to begin the ninth. And the fastball sneaks up on you from Uihara. That's it. 90 miles an hour but by Garcia. Amica Insurance proud sponsor of the Amica Pit Zone. It defies logic doesn't it guy throws 89 90 and they batter looks late but he's been doing that ever since he's pitched to the big leagues. One down here in the ninth inning for Jeff Kepinger. Kepinger 0 for 3 in the game as he is grounded out three times. I don't think there was really much question about Uihara's ability to perform coming into the season. The only question was the durability factor. And that has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, early on, they were very concerned about going back to back days and handled it very carefully. And now he's been tremendous back to back. I mean, even not knowing the injuries to the rest of the bullpen, if you would have told me early in the season that he'd be pitching an inning and a third, I would have said, You're crazy. They're not going to do that. They're not going to risk running him into the ground. They're going to protect him. They haven't had to do it, which is a refreshing thing. It's one thing to do it. Because you have no choice. I don't think they're necessarily in that situation. I think they're they're letting him pitch because he's capable of doing it and he's shown no ill effects or side effects of it. One two fouled off to the right out of play. Dempster started this game with six and a third, giving up the three runs the White Sox have. The bullpen is not allowed to run to this point to Zawa. Going an inning, Morales a third of an inning, and Uihara so far two thirds. Here's a one two. And a grounder foul. Uihara picking up his 14th save of the season on Wednesday against the Orioles. Swing and a miss and a pitch down and away. Back to back K's for Uihara. Two down in the ninth. And Kepinger is usually a high contact guy. He's not an easy guy to strike out, but he really helped out Uihara there. I mean, he chased way out of the zone. Two outs in the ninth inning for Diane Viciedo. Yeah, he'll take strike one. Fourteen pitches, twelve strikes. Don't forget, Ness's post-game coverage of the Sox begins right after the game with WB Mason's Extra Innings Live. Tim and TC will break down the highlights. WB Mason, Extra Innings Live. One one. Swing and a miss, and it's one and two. Fenway Park will stand as one with two down in the ninth. The one two on the ground to shortstop. Steven Drew's got it. Red Sox win. And Koji Uihara makes it look easy again. He retires all four batters he faces and picks up his 15th save of the year. In an impressive fashion, the Red Sox able to take this first game of the White Sox series, winning tonight 4-3. to three. And Bob's discount virtual again, donate $1,000 to the Jimmy Fund Radio Telethon for every Red Sox game saved this season. For the save, Bob's donation total this season now stands at 27000 Everybody saves money at Bob's discount furniture. Visit mybobs.com to learn more. Brian Dempster is a winner as the save goes to Uihara, and Tom Karen, Koji Uihara, continues to be lights out.